Next, we have Sunver Oberoi, who is a prominent investor and founder of Responsible AI. He will be moderating the Impact Investors and Social Entrepreneurs panel, and he will be introducing the panelists. Sunver, please feel free to take it away. Thank you, Tarani, uh, and good morning and good afternoon to sort of, uh, good evening, in fact, to wherever you are in the world that you're tuning in. Um, it's amazing we're being able to do this in a virtual format now. Um, hope, first of all, everybody's safe, um, given sort of the environment we're in. Um, okay, so we have an amazing panel uh, ahead of us. Uh, we're going to have some, um, a, a, a very interesting mix of uh, of both young and and and. Well, not so young, I, I, to put it uh, politely. Um, and so I'm just going to get straight to the point and introduce all, all my panelists, and then we're going to jump straight into it. So first, we have Anubha uh, Maneshwar. She is a young entrepreneur, founder of GirlScript Foundation. Uh, her organization has impacted over 500,000 beginners with tech education and employability skills in 14 plus countries across the world. And currently, her organization has 13 programs catering to slum children, um, all the way from slum children to working professionals. She's been a awarded a, as you can imagine, for this kind of work. She's been awarded a, a lot of awards, uh, some of them, of course, being the Forbes Asia uh, Under 30 list, as well as the um, a Women's Engineer Magazine Award, uh, as, uh, as well as the Top 8 Technology Playmaker Awards as well. Um, next we have is Tarina Ahuja. Tarina is a freshman at Harvard um, and the co-founder and executive director of the not-for-profit uh, Young Khalsa Girls. It's a grassroots organization founded in 2012 with the mission of empowering young girls to serve their communities through selfless service and advocacy. She's also the co-founder and president of the Greater Good Initiative, a youth-led policy think tank writing and uh, advocating uh, for policy at the uh, local, state, and federal levels. Um, she's also in, involved with the National Democratic Institutes and running a bunch of other organizations. She'll sort of chime into this as a part of her sort of story as well. Next, we have the stalwarts among us. And so we have Rekha Kamath. Um, Rekha is an angel, in, uh, angel and impact investor and a partner and a board member at the Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund. Um, I can say this from, from personal experience that, that Rekha is sort of a massive pillar in her own self in the social impact investment space, uh, not just uh, not just focused in the Bay Area, but actually all across both the US as well as uh, South Asia as well. Um, she serves on the board of Fast Forward, uh, which is an accelerator for tech not-for-profits based out of San Francisco. Um, in telehealth, a tech not-for-profit building intelligent tech uh, for the last mile, uh, as well as she plays a ton of roles uh, between MIT, Harvard, Stanford, across a lot of their startup-focused uh, programs and entrepreneurship-focused um, support ecosystems. And so she is a massive sort of uh, player in that in that space. And finally, we have Elizabeth um, Galbert. Uh, Elizabeth is the co-founder and managing partner of SoGal. Ventures. It is a. It's the first female-led millennial venture capital firm. And Sogal Ventures believes in the power of diversity, borderless business, next generation commerce, and human-centric design. Um, in fact, this is her second stint as a venture capitalist because even before going to business school herself, she in fact founded A-Level Capital, which is the first student-led student, student -led venture capital firm powered at um, John Hopkins University. And like Anubha, she's also on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, but for venture capital. And so that is the kind of panel that we're going to have today. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. So I'll tell you what, we're, we're just going to just jump straight into it because it's sort of the, the time crunch that we have. And this is a, a very critical topic that we're trying to cover here. And so um, first, I want to sort of bring in um, our two young entrepreneurs that we have among us. Feel free to unmute yourself now, um, Tarani, uh, sorry, uh, Tarina and, and Anupa. Um, okay, so... We have a lot of young people in the audience. Um, a lot of people in high school, a lot of people in, in 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 sort of still in university, sort of thinking about social impact, thinking about social entrepreneurship. They've heard about it, um, but they have a lot of doubts. Uh, how should they even proceed? Can they do anything while being at a young age? And so, Anupa and Tarina, starting with Anupa first, um, can you give a, a a snippet from your life journey so far uh, in terms of what got you started, why did you identify this problem statement? And even though we're still young, and I'm going to put myself in the same bracket, but even though we're still young, you can create massive impact. And so um, starting with Anupa and then Tarina, um, what is your life story so far and, and what have you been able to accomplish? Yeah, thank you so much, Sanwar, for this amazing question. And uh, uh, what got me started, I think, is because I belong from a tier three city uh, in India. Uh, and when I moved to my engineering college, I realized that there are a lot of students who are 
uh, who take up a degree program, but still they are confused. Like we are talking right now about technology, metaverse, AI, ML, what not, NFTs everywhere. Like people are going crazy. But then there are some people in a classroom, in a similar classroom, who are not that confident. Maybe they know a lot of things, but they are not able to express it. Or there are some people who are confused enough um, to what they are doing or what they will do in future. So there is a mix of people in a classroom, and I realize that only ten percent in every classroom people are self-aware. People know what to do, or they have that kind of mentorship. But rest ninety percent of the students are always struggling. Maybe they might be intelligent than those ten percent student, but still there is there is a gap. um so i identify the gap when i moved to my undergrad uh, college uh, program of computer engineering and um i thought uh, why not work on this so initially obviously it was not that easy but uh, i uh, attended this event by google called women technicals when i was in initial days of my college and then i met so many young uh, like uh, amazing women who were leading the companies who were working on applications like google maps coding uh, they were working with different bigger startups and companies and then i realized that okay if they can do it even i can bring it to smaller cities and people who are not in premier environment uh, and later on once i moved with my journey i realized that everyone in every country needs that kind of support like every beginner so the purpose of my organization big be- uh, became like uh, to support beginners in tech education and employability skills and i think that is what i uh, what got me started is to work with different communities different organizations so i worked with mozilla community mozilla campus clubs i worked with google women technicals women who code a lot of different organizations and communities like django girls and then i realized that uh, even though we are talking about bigger terms in technology right now today but there are even still people who uh, have got into a program and cannot even draft a email properly so we need to uh, customize some programs for them and we need to make sure that they are doing well so this was uh, my journey and that is how i got started yeah absolutely echoing so much of what you said and first of all your story is incredible and your impact has been incredible um and i think kind of to what you said it's all about starting with a problem starting with something that you see and seeing that you know what it doesn't matter the age that's attached to our name you have the ability to start moving and to start acting so my story actually started when i was around 12 years old um i was actually just with a friend and then i heard my mom on the phone talking about this organization called the sick human development foundation and this is a foundation meant um to make sure that young students especially in punjab have access to higher education methods and you know growing up for me as the daughter of immigrants in the us thinking about the importance of education has always been something that's been ingrained in me by such a young age and so i along with a couple of friends were like how can we help how can we fund one student and to fund one student it was $500 And so originally we were like you know what we're going to use our entrepreneurship and do a lemonade stand we tried doing that didn't work we planned it we're like we're not going to make enough and so what we ended up doing was getting many many people from our community and sending out this letter that me and three other friends had written telling everybody in our community why we were hoping to raise money um to to make sure that these students had access to education so we wanted to fund one student for $500 um but what ended up happening is with sharing the letter with going door to door and knocking on people's doors and telling them what we were doing um our schools our families our friends and trying to use our networks in any way that we could as 12 years old um we ended up being able to fund not $500 but $17,500 getting to fund over 30 students within the span of 1 to 2 weeks and so from that moment from that one project i knew that it didn't matter that we were 12 years old it didn't matter that the world was looking at us and saying oh they're cute but can they really do any anything um and so that's how the organization got started and we became um a organization that's focused on not only just doing these projects but giving young women the ability to know their worth and know that they can also go out and make impact and so what i think is so important that i see in your work and the work of everybody on this panel is taking what you know and being able to use it as 
a type of domino, a type of echo, a type of wave. Because when you're able to train others in your community, uh, the impact that you have gets amplified and multiplied um, by so much. And so then my story kind of continues when last year amid the COVID crisis, we were trying to figure out a way to mobilize the youth response. Um, and we saw that in the States, there was no avenue for young people to raise their voices on policy, public policy. And so what we did is started a youth-led, youth-run think tank that kind of goes on a similar theme, that young people have the power to do so much. And so we literally write policy, um, whether it be for local governments, school boards, whether it be city councils or the federal government, looking at policies that we're writing and working with Congress and federal agencies. We are taking the power, ideas, and passion of young people and catalyzing it into concrete action that we see in public policy. So that's a little bit about my story and about why I care so deeply about making sure that youth voice is amplified for the, the sustainable ideas and innovative solutions that we have while working with older generations to create that solidarity among us to create supernovas of change. <laughs> that it's, it's crazy to think that, that <laughs> it's just that, that you can actually create change. And, and that is, um, thank you. Thank you, Tarina and, and Arupa, because that is absolutely sort of uh, energizing. I think that we're going to start another startup after this sort of hearing you talk. Um, but okay, this is actually the perfect segue to, to sort of bring Elizabeth and, and Rekha into this conversation as well as sort of such experienced persons that, that the two of them are. Um, so Elizabeth and Rekha, and, and maybe you can just go with maybe Elizabeth first and Rekha second, but okay. Um, there are people in the audience who are thinking about uh, having an, having a career and impact, and so, um, but that could mean many things. That could be from an investor's point of view. That could be from impact consulting, and that could be actually just join a team or start your own uh, venture as well. And so, um, if you could do two things, one is if you could help lay out sort of here's here's where impact has got to today, and here's sort of what what the what the ecosystem or landscape looks like, and so here's the different career opportunities for them to, to look at. And second thing is, um, for the ones who actually do consider entrepreneurship, what, what are the kind of resources that are available to them today, uh, both within the US and maybe Rekha, if you can shed some light on some examples in South Asia, um, as well as in the US. And so Elizabeth first, and then Rekha on sort of career prospects. And then second is the ecosystem support that's available today. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think the ecosystem today is so exciting because it, Previously, right, it was kind of nonprofits versus for profits. And today we have kind of this really wonderful melding of whether you call it social enterprise or the impact world, um, but businesses that are looking really to build both profitability and, you know, sustainable business models, but also have enormous sort of bottom line impact as well on the social side where they're thinking about all their different stakeholders. Um, and so in my own journey, um, both my first fund as well as SoGal were actually started as student organizations. Um, so it was while each of us were in school and we realized, um, as some of the other panelists were saying, that there was a problem. The problem was a lot of our professors weren't bringing in um, speakers that could be role models to us because they didn't look like us. So we started bringing in resources and people from all different places that could be role models for the rest of the student base and learning from their stories of entrepreneurship and investing and kind of helping grow entrepreneurs among each other in our own student base and sort of forming teams, having projects. Um, and some of those projects grew to be so big that they then needed funding. So we started bringing in right investors. And at the time, this was in Baltimore, which doesn't have a lot of sort of an investor community going on. So we were bringing investors in from New York, from Silicon Valley, to sort of see this amazing talent, right, of the student base. And I think if you are a student, um, you have such this interesting opportunity to actually pursue and explore all these different things, right? You can work on different projects and classes. You can have a side hustle of a startup on the side. Perhaps you can get involved in different organizations, either on the impact investing side or as a student venture capital fund. And you can kind of really explore, right? Like what makes sense to you, but also learn from all the people around you and the experiences 
you're going to have and start building a network. And I think right in the impact space and in entrepreneurship in general, building a network is so important just because then you have role models, you have mentors, um, you have people that can get behind what you end up building is what I call your like adult enterprise. Um, I went through sort of many iterations of either startups, venture firms, different ideas I had before I got to where I am today. And I think that's really part of the process as you're exploring and learning. Um, and I love the word sort of praxis because right school gives you the ability to have almost a platform to fail in a sense of a platform that you can try a lot of different things and meet with a lot of people and explore what you're doing and see what kind of sticks, right? And I think that's what's being an entrepreneur is create, seeing a problem and then finding solutions for it. Um, so if you're interested in the impact space, I would say just like take roles and experiences wherever they come available to you and seek them out because you're going to learn something from each different experience. I think my biggest piece of advice is be a sponge. Um, and I'm so thankful for all the people I surrounded myself with across the journey that really helped me get to where I am today. Thank you, Rekha. Yeah. So um, thank you, first of all, Sanwar, for your kind words about me. And thank you, Elizabeth, for joining me, Tarina and Anubha. Thank you for the amazing work you do. It's so inspiring. Uh, you know, both of you are so young. And to see how much impact you've achieved, it's very inspiring. So thank you for joining me in this really critical discussion, I think. To the young people out there, I, I mean, what was helpful for me is to get like a view of history, you know, uh, to understand why uh, and how we are here today, why it's important. So, you know, Sanmar, you asked a question uh, about landscape. So uh, to go to the landscape of ESG and impact investing, it's, I think it's very important to look at the history. I mean, if, if, you, um, if you really like previously, you know, say 50 years ago, the sole purpose of business was making money, right? If you read the famous paper by Thomas Friedman from 1970, he actually argues that the only social responsibility responsibility of business is to maximize profit so our current free uh, market you know capitalism comes from that view but over the last 50 years we know what has played out right big corp has maximized profits by using unethical supply chains where labor hasn't been treated in a very humanitarian way we've seen how fossil fuels and deforestation increases co2 emissions exacerbate climate change and we've seen how gender and race biases affect how new employees are treated and rewarded and how these biases affect our culture and the entire society as a whole, right? And the pandemic is only exacerbating these inequalities, right? So uh, if you fast forward from 1970, 50 years now, if you see now, if you look at the world, all the stakeholders of these this free market capitalism, which is basically all sub sections of society, consumers, customers, employees, investors, they're all asking for how can you do better in balancing the three P's? And what I mean by the three P's, you have to balance them, people, planet, and profit, right? So if you can remember these three P's, I mean, so that's where SRI comes. And SRI is a term that's used for sustainable and responsible investing. And it incorporated, incorporates ESG strategies, which is a question I think, Sanwar, you had asked that we talk about. ESGs are just a term to, 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 to get together all the environmental, social, and governance strategies. Look it up if you don't know about it. But it's huge. ESG, ESG strategies in the investing world, it's, it, it encompasses about anywhere from 30 trillion to 85 trillion of assets. So most of the investing, a lot of the investing that's happening right now worldwide is called sustainable investing strategies. Now, where is this coming from? It's coming from public markets, right? Like from the stock markets and mutual funds focused on ESG. But it's happening because of the demand from investors, you and I, like, and 85% of the millennials and more than 53% of the women want ESG investment. So if you want to look at like what sustainable and, and so, for, you know, what does this mean for career choices is it, it, it helps you look at if you wanted a career in impact investing or just in general finance, you would have to think about SRI and um, how impact investing um, the landscape is, right? Like if you, if you think about it on one side, traditional investments on the extreme left and 
think about grants and philanthropy on the right there's a whole spectrum of investments that you can make between traditional investments that are purely for profit and grants that are purely for impact right there's a whole spectrum you can do positive or negative screens negative screens would be avoiding sin stocks right avoiding tobacco or avoiding gun stocks or fossil fuel stocks but you could also do positive screens where you look for data like board diversity or percentage of minorities in leadership like if you were doing gender investing you could look for positive screens like um, you know avoid companies that are doing um, that have a track record of of sexual harassment for example would be one which is a negative screen so you could do positive and negative screens they're all in the category of financial esg and that's so if you wanted a career in that you could go to the public markets a lot of uh, big banks a lot of uh, sovereign wealth funds a lot of banks are doing that kind of investing through their ETFs and through their mutual funds. So that is one way of participating in this. The other way is you can, if you want deeper impact, if you want to participate in finance, but want to go deeper, you can, you know, impact investing also means you want both financial return and social impact. So going on the gender lens, for example, if you invest in only minority and women led enterprises like SoGal Ventures, that would be SoGal Ventures is a, an example of an impact fund. So this is like a fund, a, a fund, a private equity fund that invests in minority and women led uh, enterprises. But that doesn't mean you get below market returns, by the way, you can get much better than market returns. Even if you impact, uh, if you, if you um, manage, or if you go for investments, which are thematic based, this is what I would call. So, so gal is a thematic based impact investing fund. Um, but there are thematic impact investing funds in all areas, right? All themes like climate and uh, circular economy and regenerative agriculture. You can find thematic funds in all kinds of uh, impact areas, impact themes. But not only in private equity, this is what I would call private equity and, and these private equity impact funds invest in all stages of capital, right? It could be early, se early stage, seed stage or the later stage as well. Or you could also work for private debt, right? Like a microfinance fund to women in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. That would be um, more concessionary return. You, you may not get full market return. It all depends on, excuse me, it all depends on how the capital is structured, how the front fund is structured. A lot of blended uh, and or converged finance models really give good returns for private in, uh, impact investors investing in private debt. So anyway, what does it mean for your career? I think you can look at impact funds that are focused on good uh, impact themes that you are really, um, you know, interested in, whether it's climate or biodiversity or sustainable food systems or say in wash like which is uh, water and sanitation things like that um, uh, so on the that is on the investor side but if you were a social entrepreneur one of the first things you have to ask yourself is what kind of customers are you serving you know are they underserved how are they underserved in that way like how how is the current need not addressed by the free market capital uh, cap, uh, you know what's already out there like you know like a, a private company or a, um, a free market capital markets right how is it not addressed by the markets already do do these uh, beneficiaries or do these customers or do these users have disposable income are they customers or stakeholders in the ecosystem who have the ability to pay like can government be an important customer but but you have to remember that you know every customer comes with its own kind of channel distribution things like that right like the way you would go to market with a government is very different or way you would sell to government is say different from where you would sell you know with a mobile app to a regular consumer right like a, a you and me so if you're doing a for-profit and i'm not going into non-profits because that may be like you know anubha and uh, tarina can speak about it but if you are doing a for-profit you could fundraise from impact investors who are individual impact investors like me which make smaller check sizes say from 25 to 150k you know or even more sometimes into early and seed stage companies or you could fundraise from private equity impact funds like SoGal Ventures whose investment thesis matches with the type of funding you're going for and when you go for this kind of funding uh, I would encourage all of you to look out the type of funding is very important to think about like not all businesses need to be giving VC style returns 
just remember that like not all company not all good sustainable businesses have to be vc style you know companies right not they don't have to seek venture returns they can be uh, perfectly good businesses sustainable businesses providing a lot of impact which can get like loan short term financing to complete project based needs if you already have customers or if you already have that earned income strategy or on the other hand you could you could uh, you may need long term uh, patient capital right if you are a research or ip based innovation that needs more investment in the discovery before you find product market fit Uh, and these are all jargon terms that i'm giving product market fit just means that you have found the perfect customer for your product uh, but you might need more um, academic style grants right like from uh, from research institutions from universities so many of you are in universities there's a lot out there i'm i'm part of the i'm a i'm a adjunct instructor at mit and we have a northeast node for the i corps program just search it just look at it if you have an ip based innovation or a research that you want to commercialize um the spark and i corps is a great opportunity for you and especially for southeast asia there's a lot also i can talk about it um sanmar you asked me to talk about it naj foundation the center for uh, social innovation it's a great accelerator uh, for southeast asia in the naj foundation check it out i also was on a panel sometimes with social alpha just check out social alpha a whole bunch of accelerators um going on in southeast asia they're actually theme focused as well um uh, and we can talk more yeah no, i think uh, i'm sorry yeah. because i'm i'm getting pinged a lot that they were running out of time though but yeah. uh No, but so I'm sorry, but clearly, sort of for everybody else, while we're now going to close the panel, but but clearly, sort of between uh, between Tarina, Anubha, Rekha, and Elizabeth, it's like each of them can do a masterclass on their own. And so, please feel free uh, to find them on social media between LinkedIn and maybe Twitter uh, or on their respective websites. And so, please feel free to reach out to them. You can even see that there is specialty uh, knowledge banks within which in each of them, and and they specialize in different things. And so, please feel free to sort of reach out to each of them individually, as well as look up each of their. organization and 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 get a get get sort of that's a good way to begin at least your your journey so um but i'm sorry i'm sorry to cut cut you off rekha but um because we've run out of sort of time on this but thank you for that very elaborate <laughs> master class on sort of finance and how to get involved um in impact investing as well but um thank you and uh, i think that that's pretty much the end of the panel so